This lesson is about conservation of momentum. The law of conservation of momentum states that the total momentum of a closed system remains constant. A system is just a fancy word for a group of objects and their interactions. And a closed system is a system to which no energy is added or removed. On the reference table, they remind you of the law of conservation of momentum by telling you P before equals P after. That is, momentum before some event is equal to the momentum after that event. Here's an example of a problem that involves the conservation of momentum. Here we have a purple ball of mass 0.4 kilograms traveling 12 meters per second toward a blue ball that is 0.3 kilograms traveling only 10 meters per second. Since the purple ball is traveling faster, it's eventually going to collide with the blue ball. And afterward, they'll both be moving in the same direction, but their velocities are going to be different. Because of the collision, the purple ball slows down to only 9.5 meters per second. What we want to figure out is how fast is the blue ball moving after the collision. Let's try to solve this methodically and look at one part of this problem at a time. Let's start with the before side. Beforehand, the momentum of the system is just the sum of the momentum of each ball. We'll call them one and two. So beforehand, we have a total momentum that is the same as the momentum of the purple ball plus the momentum of the blue ball, P1 plus P2. We could take an extra step here and write out the equation for the momentum of the purple ball and the momentum of the blue ball. It's just each one's mass times its velocity. And we can plug these numbers in. We know them. 0.4 kilograms at 12 meters per second plus 0.3 kilograms at 10 meters per second. And we find that before the collision, this system has a total momentum of 7.8 kilogram meters per second. Now, let's look at after the collision. And we'll, we'll start at the same place. After the collision, the total momentum is the sum of the momentum of the purple ball and the blue ball, again, P1 and P2. And, as good practice, we'll write out the equations, M times V for each of them. Now, before we plug things in, let's remember the law of conservation of momentum. P before equals P after. So we can plug in a value for P after, it's just going to be the same as P before, 7.8 kilogram meters per second. Then we can also plug in the masses that we know and the velocity of the purple ball, which was a given. If we solve for V2, we find that the blue ball after the collision is traveling 13.3 meters per second. Now if we look at the big picture here, we can see that the momentum of each ball is different than it was before the collision. The purple ball lost some momentum, and the blue ball gained some momentum. The law of conservation of momentum tells us that the total momentum of the system has to be the same. There are two main types of problems that we'll be working with that involve the law of conservation of momentum. The first type are called inelastic collisions. This is when two objects collide, like in the previous example, only here they stick together, and subsequently they move as one object. The other type of problem is what I call an explosion. And this doesn't have to have a, a loud bang. Right? This is simply when two objects start out together at rest, and then for some reason, they move apart from each other. Let's start with inelastic collisions. Here we have a lump of clay traveling with some velocity toward a block that's at rest on a surface. And when it collides, it's going to stick to it. And then the, the lump of clay and the block are going to move together to the right at some velocity. Before we plug in any numbers, let's take a look at how the law of conservation of momentum affects this particular problem. We start out with our reminder from the reference table that P before equals P after. The momentum of the flying blob of clay plus the momentum of the block at rest is going to be equal to the momentum of the block and blob of clay that are stuck together moving afterward. Like we did before, let's write out the equation for momentum for each side. Only now, instead of doing it as just the before side and then as the after side, we're going to kind of do it all together. You'll see. So here's what I would write. I would say that beforehand, there is a momentum of the clay. We'll call that 1, M1, V1. And there's the momentum of the block, M2, V2. Afterward, they move as one object. So rather than write two M times V terms, instead, Let's acknowledge that this one object is moving together at the same speed, and the mass of this 
object is the sum of the two masses. So afterward we have just one object with a mass of m1 plus m2 moving at some final speed. This might make more sense in a minute when I show you some numbers and we substitute. Before we do that though, let's take a look at what's going on beforehand. That block is at rest. Its velocity is zero. That means m2 v2, whatever the mass is times zero, is zero. And that's almost always going to be the case when we look at inelastic collisions. A moving object is going to collide with the stationary object, and then those two objects are going to move off together at some speed. This is going to be our general equation for inelastic collisions. Now let's make up some numbers. Let's say the blob of clay is 1.2 kilograms, moving at 16 meters per second, colliding with the block that is at rest, and has a mass of 9 kilograms. Afterward, the mass of the kind of one object is 1.2 kilograms plus 9 kilograms, and we want to figure out how fast would this be moving. So we could take all those numbers and we can plug them into the equation, and we'll see that we only have one variable, and we'll solve for it. Beforehand, all we have is the momentum of the clay, 1.2 kilograms times 16 meters per second, and afterward we have the one object that has a mass of 1.2 kilograms plus 9 kilograms, moving at some speed vf, and that's what we're looking for. So do a little algebra, 9.2 kilogram meters per second equals 10.2 kilograms times VF. And then we can find that this clay block system is moving at 1.9 meters per second after the collision. Once again, let's take a look at the big picture. Afterward, there's a lot more mass moving, but the law of conservation of momentum tells us that the total momentum has to be the same as before. So if we have a lot more mass moving after they collide and stick together, then that object must be moving at a much slower speed, and that's exactly what we see. Let's go back to our definitions of these types of problems and write this equation, plain as day, where we will remember it and be able to refer to it. M1V1 plus zero, and I like that zero to remind us that there's an object there, but it is at rest, equals the sum of m1 plus m2 times the final speed. Now let's move on to explosions. Here we have a cannon and a cannonball that are both at rest. The cannon is just sitting at rest on the ground, and the cannonball is just sitting at rest on the inside. Now we're going to light the fuse and fire the cannonball. As you can see, the cannonball has some velocity to the right, and the cannon has some what we call recoil velocity to the left. And we can use the law of conservation of momentum to figure out that recoil velocity. But again, let's first use the law of conservation of momentum to write a general equation for this type of problem. Like before, we'll start with the basic statement that the total momentum before is equal to the total momentum after. And in this case, we have two separate objects before and after. At no point are they in a situation where they're stuck together and would have to move together. What's convenient in this type of problem is that before the explosion, everything is at rest. The cannon is at rest on the ground, and the cannonball is at rest inside the cannon. After, we see that the two objects are moving in opposite directions. We can't call both of those directions positive, so we're going to choose to call the direction that the cannonball is moving negative. If we put these together, we're going to find the following equation. Beforehand, there is zero momentum, and afterward, we have the momentum of each object adding together, but the momentum of one of the objects is going to be negative. If we rearrange this equation a little bit, we get the very straightforward equation m1v1 equals m2v2. The momentum of the cannon after the explosion is the same as the momentum of the cannonball, and they happen to be in opposite directions. This is a very important equation. Now, let's make up some numbers for this problem and actually solve for the recoil velocity of the cannon. Let's say that the cannon has a mass of 250 kilograms, the cannonball has a mass of 15 kilograms, and after the explosion, the cannonball is moving 50 meters per second. What's the final velocity of the cannon? All we have to do is plug those numbers in. 250 kilograms times V1 equals 15 kilograms times 50 meters per second. And when we do some algebra, we find that the velocity of the cannon is 0.33 meters per second. That's what we call the recoil velocity. Just like before, let's go back to our definitions page and write that equation for explosions. M1V1 equals M2V2. 